Hi, I'm Mara Webster with InCreative Company, and thank you so much for tuning into one of our talks today. We are a year-round talk series bringing you the best creative voices in entertainment, and I'm so excited today to be joined by the fantastically talented musician Azinma. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit about your journey in going back to school once you were already pursuing a professional career as a musician. And, you know, that was really the space where you started to find your style and, and this aesthetic of really taking classical music and modern music um, through a music production class that you took. And, and when you first started just feeling it out what what were kind of the different stylistic approaches that you were trying to that and finding the different rhythms and beats and stories within music yeah so that class that I actually took was with a violinist named Todd Reynolds who is a contemporary violinist he works with this amazing group called Bang on a Can which is run by Meredith Monk and I remember when I took that class I had never heard anybody play the violin the way that he does you know he can you know he'll intentionally make a bit of a rough sound or he'll press a bit and it's very not classical it's not the most beautiful sound but you know just that freedom of expression was something that inspired me to experiment exp inspired me to mix different genres different sounds and textures together and i really think that i don't know just that experience in that class um not only the production side but just to see the violin push to so many different limits was something that for me was really a ground in which I could experiment from. And also part of the genesis of, of wanting to study more was also in wanting to take on scoring with within film, um, you know, and you've since worked on projects like the Bill Cunningham documentary and a couple of short films. And, and I'm interested in particularly when you're working on a documentary project, because that's such a different beast in terms of finding what the sound is going to be. Are you really looking and focusing a lot more on the post-production elements and feeling out what the rhythm and the pacing of a lot of the cuts are as it's telling the story? Um, yeah, so usually when it comes to something like a documentary, because there's, especially for the one on Bill Cunningham, Basically, why it's so amazing is the director just had this unedited footage of Bill Cunningham just talking, right? So with that project, it was interesting because there's so much dialogue. I had to be really mindful that, you know, the rhythm and the pacing wouldn't interfere, but would really just enhance everything. Um, I also got to work with Moby. I don't know if you know, remember who Moby is, but he was a part of it as well. And that was so cool. But I think for me, when I was approaching that project, it was really you know, I think I'd been in artist mode for so long that it was like, first of all, this isn't about me, right? This is about serving the documentary, serving Bill Cunningham, serving the voice of the project. And I was really forced to just take a step back and realize how can I have the most impact while doing the least? So that was kind of my approach. And that's not my approach for music generally. If you heard my music, it's like so much is happening. But um, that was kind of my approach for that. Right. And when you, particularly when you're working on a cover version of a song, one of the things I love the most about it is that you almost take the sound of what the song is at the beginning and you play into that for a second. And then you really think about all the different directions that you can take it. You know, something yeah. like your Lil Nas X cover, where at the beginning you're kind of playing along for a second and then it's just this complete freestyle riff, it almost feels like. Yeah. When you're doing that, how much? How do you begin that journey of thinking about the different sounds that are really going to fit into the world that is the initial concept and shape of what it is, but really give it all these different other elements? Yeah, you know, I, I've, I kind of imagine like, you know, if you have a big block of marble and you're about to make a sculpture and you're just kind of, you don't just start chipping in right away. You have to kind of analyze and take a look and be like, well, it could be like this. It could be, you know, perhaps this could be the angel wing or that could be the face or whatever. Like there's so many different directions you can take. It. And that's how I feel about covers, which is why I love doing them so much. Um, and I think I enjoy giving people the most obvious type of cover, which is just the melody and then kind of branching off and doing something that people would never expect. Um, in terms of how I do that, I don't really know. I think it's I think it's about, first of all, the artists that I'm covering, like I kind of imagine what their vibe would be. You know, I wanna do something that would, I don't know, they, that if they were to listen to it, they'd be like, oh, I like this, right? Um, and I know I have met some artists who've listened to my covers and they're like, wow, like that was crazy. And I think that is because I do wanna be sensitive to who that artist is and like what best serves the song. But also I just enjoy, for me now, I've been doing covers for so long, it's really just about how many boundaries can I push, right? Like I already have original music out. I'm already doing these things that I want to do. So it's like, how can I take these covers and give as much classical 
vibes and textures to all of these people, to the mass public, but in a way that is digestible and fun and interesting for them while still serving the song. Yeah. And with the fact that you had already spent so much time thinking about cover versions in that way and what you could stylistically add to an existing track, did you find that that was a really helpful skill set and, and tool for you to have developed when you started working for other artists, you know, when you started working with Beyonce? Because you're you're not just thinking about what you're bringing to the table as an artist, you're also thinking about narratively what is the story that she's trying to tell as well and, and folding your sound into that. Yeah, 100%. I just think there is you know, as I mature and as I do more work and I'm, and I'm, you know, get to work with more artists, I, I think that for me, I'm learning to, obviously my sound is going to be, and my, my originality and authenticity is going to be embedded in whatever it is that is written. And I think there was a time where I was like, oh, but what about me? What about me? What about my voice? But as I'm growing in the industry, I realize that it's just about collectively coming together and serving a bigger picture, right? It's like when somebody hires you to write a string arrangement, for instance, for Black Panther, I did the string arrangement for all the stars. It's not about me showing off. It's about serving the piece and giving Kendrick Lamar something that is in Disney. I mean, something that is just going to soar and, and be uplifting. And so I think for me, that's always in the back of my mind. And I think that sensitivity, to be honest, really comes from classical music. You know, I think in classical, there's so many times where you're playing chamber music, you're working in, in an orchestra, and it's not just about you, it's about the whole, the collective. And um, I love chamber music, I love collaborating. So I think for me, it's it's always a joy to serve a bigger picture and see how can I enhance what you're already doing. And in the fact that you kind of bring this real sense of freedom to the way that you perform and the way that you compose pieces, but obviously you started out training classically, what was that journey for you and just starting to really experiment with different types of sounds and different things that you could do with an, in, with an instrument, particularly that's such a historical item and object to begin with? Yeah. You know, I, I think, to be honest, I was actually talking to my mom yesterday and she was telling me, you know... I, when I was little, apparently, I would just be playing my violin to the radio. I'd have like my little stuffed animals would be in my band. And I would just be like going to town on my instrument. And I think even though I have no idea what I was hearing in my mind, I have no idea what it sounded like. I wish there were videos of that. Um, I think that I've always kind of been experimental when it comes to the violin, when it comes to classical music, even though I wasn't aware that that was an option. For instance, I you know, with my teachers, I would always be getting in trouble because I would change a rhythm slightly or I'd add like a little note or I would add a slide and it's just not really appropriate. It's kind of like wearing, let's say you're going to a gala and you're wearing like, I don't know, red patent. If you're a guy and you're wearing like a red patent leather suit or something, it's just like not appropriate when everybody else is in a black tux. So that's kind of how these little things, you know, were to my teachers and my professors. And it wasn't that I was intentionally trying to change things. I just thought it sounded better, right? And I think that spirit of experimentation has always been in me, but um, now that I'm doing what I'm doing and you know, I'm able to make original music and put out these covers and and perform and, and tell my story, it doesn't feel as wrong. And so I just kind of do it unapologetically. That's the difference. Do you think that that spirit of experimentation is also very true to the way that you think about movement as well? You know, because there's a really big difference to sitting in a choir where there is a little bit of space for movement, but in a very structured way to, you know, performing on the streets of New York and moving around or kind of like laying in a hammock for a music video. Yeah. <laughs> All these different ways that you find movement as a communication for your music as well. Yeah, you know, I think because there aren't lyrics in what I do, um, movement is just so important. And I think first and foremost, it's natural for me. Um, I've always just moved a lot as a player and it used to be such a, I remember my teacher, you know, it just drove her nuts. Like one time she like, actually picked me up and like put me upside down. Um, Cause I'd moved so much. She was like a very tough Japanese teacher. Amazing. I was obviously very young because, you know, she was not a very large woman and not, but as apparently very strong. Right. So I, I think for me, movement again it was just kind of something that was a bit taboo and then finally I was like wait I can do whatever I want let me just move the way I want to move and I think that it's become an added tool of my expression I, I know we're not in live performances right now but you know before COVID hit at like performances and stuff people would say and the way that you move with the violin I'm like who even pay, really pays attention to that? But I think, you know, as humans, we respond to movement the same way that we respond to, to music and to visual and all that stuff. And so 
I think for me, it is another form of expression for me just to be able to move freely. And, and, you know, off the back of that, there's so many aspects of what you do that are really nonverbal forms of communication, whether it's the movement within the music, the actual performance of the music itself, or the story that you're telling through these music yeah. videos. And, and particularly in terms of the different structures that you bring forth in your videos, you know, there's some that have a real story that you're telling, like Vivaldi Springs yeah. Forth, where you have you, and then you have a young black girl learning to play the violin and, and kind of jumping back and forth between the two of them. And there's some that are a little bit more ethereal in terms of their concept. So do you feel like when you're constructing the idea for how you visually want to present one of your pieces in that way with a video, that the nonverbal communication that you've already got is such an intrinsic part of you really feeds into your voice in that way? Oh yeah, um, 100%. And again, I think it's just because there are no lyrics, it, I just feel that it's just so important for what I do for any sort of instrumental music. Um, and, you know, we're actually getting ready to shoot another video this week um, for another single that's coming out. And I'm already like, okay, so who are the dancers? Like, we got to we gotta get the movement in there because it's just, to me, I love it so much. And I also think that, you know, the same way that I love film music and kind of the blending of visual with, with sound, um, I just find it inspiring to make as much content and video and music videos and all that stuff that are compelling from not only the sound perspective and the storyline but also from the movement so yeah I think it's inseparable for me yeah. and I love the way that when you describe classical music you always bring up the point that classical music at its time was modern music and so what you're doing is actually bringing together two forms of modern music do you find that there's lots of similarities in in spaces where the rhythms and the beats and the nuances of it really just naturally fit together or do you feel like you're really building and constructing that when you're melding these two forms together you know I think they just blend so easily um I you know, I have never, ever, ever had a hard time trying to fit in some iconic classical piece. And of course that narrows down classical music by a lot. I've never had a hard time fitting that into a hip hop beat ever. Um, there's just something so, you know, I think that there's something, you know, hip hop is very regular, right? It's like, mm, ch, mm, mm, ch, right? It's like a very predictable beat pattern and same thing with classical music, right? It's especially early classical music, it's very, one, two, three, four. And so you, it, it's easy just to lift it and put it in, right? I just think that most people don't think of doing that. Um, even, you know, I think jazz is something that might be more complicated because it's just so much more free and there are, the rules were just being broken so quickly at that time when people were making jazz. But with classical, it's just, there's something that just feels so right and natural about blending them. And I think, you know, if Beethoven were alive today, he would 1000% be a producer, right? It's like, you don't write, dun, 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 dun. like, you don't write something like that and not follow that up with like some great beats. I just think that he is, even though he is, of course, this iconic classical composer, if he were alive today, he would be all over the music industry. And um, I think working in so many, we hear him on the radio all the time, right? And I think that's just what is so inspiring to me about classical is that what you said, it's not this old thing, it's actually modern, right? It's just, we've kind of detached from it and I want to reconnect people with that. And, and with your own way in which you produce your music and you're not necessarily even just thinking about your own work as a violinist, but sometimes you're thinking about other musicians to bring in, you know, whether it is another violinist, whether it's someone who's coming in and bringing a beatbox rhythm as a performer, um, what's the journey of just really feeling the sound and thinking about what some of the different elements are and when you want to bring that in and when you really want to just keep it very stripped down? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think when I'm working with other people, um, and, and I love, again, I love collaborating. So when I'm working with other people, I really just love to kind of let everybody have their input and then make decisions later. Um, but then when it comes to working by myself, um, which I do a lot and I also love very much, um, you know, I kind of just put everything out there. I, I, I've worked very hard to not censor myself um, when I'm writing and creating because I think that sort of the self-editing is what prevents a lot of ideas from ever getting out. And I just kind of put everything out there and then I go through and I cut things up or I, or I strip everything away or I leave just this tiny little thing that seems inconsequential when everything is in there. But then with a little bit of reverb and delay, it's suddenly this really cool sound. Um, but I think for me, like working from everything and then kind of, again, back to the marble analogy, then chipping away and, and building 
what I want from what I've created is my favorite route about when it comes to creating. Yeah. And you've talked previously about how for you, part of how you find it most conducive to work and find that creativity is actually just to step away from all the noise and, and find a quiet space. Have you found that because of that, everything over the last year has actually been slightly conducive to your process and, and really allowed that creativity to flow much more easily? Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting. I, um, at, you know, at first it was so hard, right? Just to have everything shut down and have all this time you're not traveling you're like wait a minute like I there's so many boxes I hadn't even you know unpacked in my apartment because I just was gone so much um so to settle in was really really nice and then I got you know very creative I was writing a lot um just kind of becoming obsessed with film music and film score and kind of writing just different things right I was just exploring and having all this time and feeling the safety the safety and I think this kind of expansiveness as well just from kind of shutting everything out you know you weren't I wasn't going outside very much I was just staying home and staying safe and I think for me that really allowed my creativity to flourish um and it's I feel very privileged to say that just because there's been so much suffering and so many people don't have the luxury to say that um so I'm very aware of that but for me I think this past year has just been in so many ways it's just I think opened my mind to so many creative ideas that I've had, but I haven't really been able to honor just because I've been so busy. And there was a point about a year ago where you were also talking about right before the shutdown about wanting to bring more figures into your life and into your world that could be mentorship figures to you and, and both in the music industry, but beyond. What was it that you felt that you were really looking for from those people that you wanted to bring in? And, and because of everything that happened, have you had that opportunity to do that? Or is that something that you're still striving for? Yeah, you know, I actually just got off the phone with my mentor just now. Um, and I, I think for me, I just, I've just kind of wanted to have more guidance. And I think, you know, when you're in the music industry and you're, and you're working and, you know, there's social media and all these different forces, it's really easy to lose sight of what it is that you truly want for yourself. And I think um, being able to have a mentor, I, you know, I also have an amazing violin coach that I work with. It just kind of keeps me in alignment. Um, just with myself. And at the end of the day, I think for all of us, that's really the most important thing we can do is show up for ourselves, um, honor our truest intentions. And that comes out in the music as well. I, I, I have so many friends who've, you know, it's, it's tragic stories of, you know, getting derailed or, or this bad management situation or that situation. And I think I'm very blessed to have an amazing team around me at all times. And it's so, it's so interesting that you mentioned that, you know, this past year I just really worked to have more mentors in my life. And 2021 has been amazing so far because they've helped me through some pretty big changes. I'm actually moving to LA in six days. My apartment is like all boxes, which is why I'm in this random corner in my kitchen. Um, but like, yeah, it's just been a lot of transition and um, very exciting things coming. But yes, mentor, anybody watching this, have a mentor, right? And I think it's it never hurts to have somebody you can talk to you about anything and just kind of advise and remind you of what your purpose is. And on the other side of that, you're also that figure to other people within the industry in many ways. And particularly you have your organization, the Heartstrings Foundation. And, and I know that one of the things that you've done recently is build an online curriculum for you know young violin students and young musicians. What were the things that you really wanted to impart through that curriculum, particularly because the voice that you've created in the industry didn't exist until you started doing that? Mm. Wow. Um, well, thank you. I, I think for me, the biggest thing is just visibility. I, I believe that, you know, I was, I was just reading a statistic the other day about less than 2% of people in orchestras are people of color, black people. Um, and that, that was just so disturbing for many reasons. And I think it's not because, you know, it's just about opportunity, right? And Heartstrings for me is really just about giving that opportunity. And, you know, it's, it's a very small program, um, but, you know, I think just to be able to give children the option to have an instrument, to take lessons, to be able to go to Carnegie Hall for a concert, that's something that I believe is really important. And um, I've been blessed to, you know, have a really strong support system to be able to have an instrument, to be able to have lessons. It was not easy for my family at all, um, but they made it a priority. And I'm, I'm so grateful to them for that. And not everybody has that. And I just want to do whatever I can to 
have that be my legacy, right? Just to inspire children to play an instrument, right? And I think specifically children of color because it's not, they're not enough, right? And I just wanna help change those numbers. Yeah. And you were mentioning, you know, the great team that you have around you. And when you were offered a record label deal, you actually were counterbalancing between two different offers. And as an artist and musician, it's so important to protect exactly what it is that you want to say individually and, and to keep right. that voice intact. So what were the types of conversations and questions that you were asking to make sure that that was their priority as well in representing you? Oh, man. I mean, that's a very, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, Honestly, the biggest thing for me was what would be my creative control? What would be, you know, will you listen to me if I have issues? You know, will you, will you hear me out? Will you change my creative ideas? Will you tell me not to do this? Will you tell me not to put that out? And it's interesting because even it's a constant, it's a constant battle, right? And, um, I, I made the right decision, um, but I just think anytime you're working within a huge company and a huge machine, you just have to make sure you have people advocating for you, right? Even the best situation in the world, it's so hard to be like, no, this is who I am. This is my sound. This is what I'm about. I'm not doing that. I don't want to wear my hair like that. I don't want to, like, it's just so hard. And you hear so many stories of, you know, I, I was reading Alicia Keys's, um, her new book and it's like, you know, she was wearing her hair in braids and how the label was like, no, we don't, we don't want you to wear your hair like that. And she was like, this is who I am. And I think that's so remarkable, especially for her to be so young and be able to be able to say that. Like, and I think for me, you know, when it comes to working with a label, I'm just so grateful for my team. I'm grateful for my mentors and I'm grateful that they always listen, but it's, you know, there are times where it gets pretty serious, right? I'm like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, and it, you just have to fight for yourself. And they do respect me and they, and they do listen, which is, I'm so grateful for. Not everybody's that fortunate. Um, but yeah, I was very cautious about signing. Um, it took me a very long time to sign because I just, you hear these horror stories, right? And I just didn't want to be another statistic in that. But, you know, I think we've had a great relationship so far and I'm, we're going to keep working. So I'm excited. It also sounds like you've always had this really incredible gut instinct and inner voice, whether it's, you know, going all the way back to your childhood when they tried to tell you that you were fifth chair and you challenged your way all up to first chair and then held that position until you went to college or, you know, working with Beyonce for a couple of years and then stepping away when there's an opportunity to go on tour so that you could focus on your solo music. Do you feel like you've, you've consciously always just thought very strongly and, and very hardly about focusing on the voice that's inside your head and really blocking out those ideas and expectations of what other people think that you should be doing and what the right choice for you is in your career yeah I mean that's just my mantra I, I I've you know I, I even when I started uh, when I first went to college I was doing pre-medicine because I you know my dad wanted me to be a doctor and you know my dad's West Indian so it's like you know you don't really a musician that's not a real job he's like that's a hobby and I listened to him and I did it and I was miserable and I think that experience kind of just set me up for the way that I wanted to live the rest of my adult life, which is, you know, I'm going to listen to, I'm going to listen to everybody. I'm going to listen to what you have to say. It's not that I'm not just going to rule you out, but at the end of the day, if it's not in alignment with my own goals, my own wishes, then I, I just can't do it. Right. I'd much rather make a mistake than do, than not give myself a chance. And that's kind of been my guiding light in my career. And there've been some big moments like that Beyonce decision was very, very hard, right? Um, walking away from security into the unknown of like, I don't know what my next job is. I don't know, you know, what I'm gonna do. And then sure enough, you know, a few months later I get a record deal offer. So I think there is this crazy way of when you leap the net will appear, but putting that trust into a net that you cannot see you know, that can be very hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's definitely my guiding light is, I mean, obviously my faith, but then also just wanting to believe in my instinct and my intuition. That's so fantastic to kind of have that really strong internal voice in. And I think that's so much as to why you've been able to create such a distinctive sound and aesthetic within the industry. And, and I just want to thank you so much for sharing all of this with us this afternoon. Thank you.